So what, what is your field and in what institution do you work and teach and do research? Well, I have a chair in economic history, but um, I regard myself as uh, a generalist. And I've worked in many different fields. And uh, to the extent that I'm an historian, I'm cheating a little, because at the moment I'm interested mostly in the present and to a considerable extent in the future as well. Uh, the institution I work in is Oxford University, but more particularly, I'm a fellow of All Souls College. All Souls is a true community of scholars. Uh, it helps that it's quite a rich institution. Uh, it's an institution that we couldn't invent today. We've inherited it from the Middle Ages, from the late Middle Ages. Uh, it's evolved gradually, and I think it embodies in perhaps the purest forms the ideals of the 19th century university. <laughs> so, complete uh, Lehrfreiheit, complete freedom of teaching and complete freedom of research in an atmosphere of collegiality and material abundance. <laughs> What more could you ask for? I think that as soon as one describes it, one realizes how different it is from the rest of the academic world. And when, um, when you started, what were your expectations about, about your field, about, about the university itself? And I was educated. I took my first degree in Jerusalem. The University of Jerusalem, at any rate, the departments that I studied in, although the teaching was in Hebrew, the atmosphere was that of Germany before the First World War. So there's a general atmosphere of broad cultural building and so on. And I've always uh, held on to this as an ideal of education and teaching, uh, although sometimes that has not been easy. <laughs> uh, then I took my uh, doctorate in Oxford. Oxford is also committed to that ideal to some extent, but not in the discipline I was actually working in. So I was working in social science. And Oxford didn't quite understand social science. Social science is pretty Americanized and actually works on different types of ideas and principles. And this tension has gone throughout my work. So I remain committed to the ideals of uh, civilization, if you wish, which are partly aesthetic ideals and partly moral ideals. But uh, in academic capacity, I also have to conform to social science notions of what science is about. <laughs> so there's a kind of scientific cast to the way in which academic work is done in the social sciences. Whether it's justified or not is another question. Is it justified? And how, what is your picture of the future of social sciences? Ah. I think one needs to distinguish... Uh, the difference, the issue of the future of the institutions of uh, scholarship and the future of scholarship itself. Uh, I think that, like most social institutions, uh, higher education is falling under the sway of market doctrines and its substitute in the public sector which is known as the new public management. This is an attempt to simulate <coughs> Mostly, the, what are the uh, supposed incentives of market systems, uh, apply them to higher education in the name of greater efficiency, or actually, the people who apply them don't really know why they apply them. They look like a good idea, but if you drill down to the bedrock of this ideology, you find nothing there. There aren't any texts, there aren't any doctrines, Uh, this is simply handed down by word of mouth and diktat, in particular, from government departments, from ministers who themselves don't have a clear idea of why they're doing what they're doing. They're advised by uh, recent graduates of social science faculties uh, who vaguely remember what they've been taught in class, and they issue position papers and so on. So, uh, the effect of this, I think, is to undermine 
the freedoms that I spoke about before, the freedom to think and the freedom to teach and the freedom to research, which we've inherited from the liberal university of the 19th century, into an attempt to direct teaching and research. So there's a kind of proletarization, an attempt to regiment higher education. That's one side of it. The other side of it is that if you look at um, institutions of higher education, universities to be more particular, these are among the most resilient institutions in history. They've been going on, uh, when a regime change, changes, the universities stay, and the staff often stay. Uh, quite often when a country goes through dark ages, the universities don't do too well either. But even in places like the Soviet Union, I don't want to talk about Nazi Germany, although Nazi Germany had Heidegger. I don't know what we should think of Heidegger. Uh, but even in places like the Soviet Union, where universities were uh, quite strictly controlled and regulated, uh, they generated quite a lot of genuine scholarship and science. So in that respect, I think that the future of the, the institutions of higher education have a future regardless of the doctrines that govern them, because the one thing that the bureaucrats and the apparatchiks cannot do is to follow you into the classroom and into the study, uh, just because that's, that's the mode of production. That might change, but so long as knowledge is produced in that way and transmitted in that way, there's a core level of autonomy uh, which is maintained. On the other hand, I think that uh, a career in scholarship is going to be less attractive in the Anglo-Saxon world than it was in the last 30, 40, 50 years. Um, but I also think that other things are going to be less attractive, not only for the universities. I think that the prospect for uh, most prosperous countries today is not a good one. Uh, what form this will take? I actually think that um, the new public management, the marketi marketization doctrines uh, are bad signs. If they're intended as a form of an attempt to understand reality, I think they're bad signs. If they're means of control, uh, I don't think they're terribly effective except in a negative way, in a destructive way. If you actually want to uh, weaken higher education, if you want to weaken scholarship, uh, which is a public policy in some countries, you know, in the United States, in Israel, these are two countries I know, uh, there's a view that uh, it's called elitism, that uh, scholars have perhaps enjoyed too much of a good thing and maybe they should be put back in their place. Uh, so I think that is uh, also not really thought through. I don't think that there's any clear design there except for quite a... Uh, I should call it primitive... Uh, quest by big money to assert its control over society, and one can see this as an expression of it. And what, what is the, um, the best uh, curriculum for the future? Uh, what would be the, an ideal scenario for the university of the late 21st century? Um, ideal for what? What is the purpose? You know, a university serves a variety of purposes. Uh, serves a training purpose for, for the elites and increasingly for the middle level workers of society. It imparts a variety of necessary skills. Uh, it develops technologies. There's a whole range of uh, functions of that kind which are currently focused on the university. Um, actually, let me step back a bit. There's an interesting question. I said the power of money. Uh, one of the things that's been happening in the last 30 or 40 years is that capitalism in the West uh, has been less and less productive uh, for reasons that we don't need to go into. 
And so there's a quest, it's called a quest for yield. It's a quest by, if you have money, it needs to keep producing. So there's a quest to keep the revenues flowing. And one way of doing this has been to extend market provision into the public services because that provides guaranteed flows of revenue. So an idea which is beginning to gain ground is that maybe we can privatize the universities. Uh, that could succeed, you know. Uh, I think bad things can happen and good things can be destroyed. So I wouldn't rule those things out. Uh, the only thing I can say is that they are not progressive, they are destructive. Societies go in cycles, uh, or can go in cycles, and that societies can shoot themselves in the foot, and that uh, the forces of bad, and when I say bad, what I refer to is the prospects for the ordinary person. Uh, so forces that are bad can actually take over, and I think that privatization movement into higher education is a force of that kind. So that could happen. That's quite an extreme scenario. Um, on the whole, I think it's not easy to make a profit in that area. It, in general, it's the public services are difficult to privatize because there's an issue of the credibility of the product. Essentially, when you're getting a um, public service, you do not want an adversarial relationship with the supplier. Because if the supplier is trying to profit out of you at the same time as delivering the service, then they, have, they face a conflict of interest, which is quite difficult to resolve. We see this in the American health system. Uh, so I think that in terms of quality, in terms of uh, benefit, uh, a development of this kind, uh, will be harmful to scholarship, will be harmful to the product, the only people it might be. Again, I think that if there are forces that are pushing in this direction, and that is unquestionable, because there are political parties that are pushing in that direction, I'm not sure that they know that they entirely understand their own self-interest. I think this is a self, these are self-defeating moves. Uh, which can only arise from people who think themselves entirely separately from society and think that they can enrich themselves, that there is an, some meaning to self-enrichment which stands apart from the fate of society more generally. <laughs>